They were built by the ancients in a time before Christ, to a scale that's unbelievable. They dare their creators to push engineering to new heights, which still astound us today. Architecture and sculpture continue to stand in the shadow of their genius. Now, by revealing the secrets of the past, we can unlock the mysteries of their construction, which earn them the highest distinction as the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Great Pyramid is the only survivor of the seven ancient wonders, the finest monuments of all time. The others have fallen, taking with them the secrets of their history and construction. They laid the foundations of human achievement, becoming the building blocks of modern architecture and sculpture. From the world's largest pyramid to the very first skyscraper, the seven ancient wonders were all massive construction projects. They challenged their creators to conquer the scale of their ambitions. The seven ancient wonders are a great example of how people build to impress, build to a scale which seems almost incredible, almost as if they were intending to make people look at them and say, well, could this have been possible? To solve nearly insurmountable construction problems, visionary architects were forced to conquer the unknown with extraordinary results. There were the hanging gardens of Babylon, built high above ground, displaying their color in the middle of a desert. I'm most intrigued by the hanging gardens of Babylon. I wish it was still there. Of all the seven wonders, that is the one that I wish had not been destroyed. It's so unusual. It excites one's imagination. Exotic and mysterious, they have enchanted us through the ages, standing upon an arid plain. How were the Babylonians able to conceive them? The ancient gardeners had a great knowledge of horticulture, but what plants were they able to grow in the hanging gardens? The first cranes were used to construct the world's largest marble temple. It was supported by a forest of fluted columns 60 feet high. How were the ancients able to achieve such detail while working on such an enormous scale? Using simple techniques, they overcame the most difficult problems. Solid marble lintels weighing 40 tons were lowered with hair's breadth precision. It was one of the examples of the ways in which these early Greek architects were responding to the desire to build huge edifices with huge blocks of stone and needing new technologies to cope with it. An ingenious technique was used to create the finest sculpture of all time, the giant statue of Zeus, lifelike in every detail. How was it possible to create a statue of ivory taller than a four-story building? The overwhelming flash and brilliance of all the materials at that scale uh, is something we can only imagine in our minds. The sculptor who created it used a secret recipe to shape the ivory. But how did he achieve such realism? The originality of its design has inspired artists and sculptors to copy it throughout the centuries. The Pharos, a lighthouse, was the world's first skyscraper standing over 400 feet high. How were the ancients able to build so high without modern equipment? The Pharos blasted its golden light 50 miles out to sea. What mechanism could cast a beam so far? For centuries, the secrets of its construction lay hidden beneath the sea. So we are on the place here, on the underwater site. Now, a marine archaeologist and his team are recovering its remains from the sea floor to discover how the Pharos once stood. The seven ancient wonders created the building technologies of today. It was the invention of the crane by the ancients that enabled them, and now us, to lift heavy weights high onto a building. The ancients dared to build high. Until little more than a century ago, the Great Pyramid remained the tallest structure on Earth. Only with modern engineering have we mastered the technology to build higher, giving rise to our finest skyscrapers and even buildings made out of glass. One thing I learned to respect the Egyptians is the, is the proportion of that pyramid. 
the Egyptians were right 4,000 years ago. The ancient builders took risks to attempt the impossible. Now, nothing has left the chance. The computer has allowed us to test designs that before we couldn't have tested. And that's given us the confidence to actually proceed with these designs and be daring. A good example of an early use of the computer was Sydney Opera House, which was a very unusual structure. Today's creations stretch to the heavens, but their foundations are embedded deep in the past. They rest upon the seven wonders of the ancient world, which still challenge and amaze us after thousands of years. Their origins lie in the ancient Greek world. Although all seven wonders lay inside the Greek Empire, only one stood within mainland Greece. In the 5th century BC, Greece was invaded by Persian armies. By 480 BC, the Persians had taken Athens, destroying much of the city. But the Greeks fought back and defeated the Persians. Within 10 years, the statesman Pericles came to power. Athens was rich from the spoils of war. Pericles commissioned monuments glorifying its victory, including a new temple to the goddess Athena, the Parthenon. It was decorated with lavish friezes, the most famous are known today as the Elgin Marbles. The finest Greek sculptors worked on the Parthenon. Pericles was so impressed with one in particular, named Phidias, that he made him the chief designer. Phidias would become the Michelangelo of the Greek age. Phidias was asked to make a statue of the goddess Athena to stand inside the Parthenon. Crafted from ivory and gold, he designed it to stand 40 feet high. Statues and monuments were being commissioned across the country, and artistic rivalry was intense. Phidias was determined that his Athena would outshine every other statue in Greece. Phidias's great achievement was to meet this challenge, and after he made the Athena, virtually every other Greek town wanted such a statue. Phidias was heralded as a genius, but his name became blackened by scandal. On completing the Athena, he was unable to account for all the gold he had used. Phidias was accused of embezzlement by those eager to bring down his powerful patron. Fortunately for Phidias, news of his spectacular Athena had traveled to Olympia. He was now commissioned to make a statue of Zeus to stand inside the temple there. So, in 438 BC, to escape the scandal in Athens, Phidias left for Olympia. The site of the Olympic Games was dominated by a temple. It awaited Phidias' masterpiece. The Olympic Games attracted competitors from all over the Greek world. Wars stopped when the games were held in honor of Zeus, the supreme god. Phidias arrived in Olympia to take up his new commission. With his reputation on the line, he approached the great temple. So it seems that the Eleans, having seen or heard about what was up in Athens, decided, we want one of those too and we want Phidias to make it for us. And they went and they commissioned him to do that. Until Phidias, ivory carving had only been executed on a small scale. Phidias designed the Zeus to be taller than a four-story building. It would fill one end of the temple. It was too large to be carved out of solid blocks of ivory. So he developed a technique which has never been surpassed. The structure of ivory is such that you can unscroll it. You have to imagine it as if you're unpeeling an onion or putting a pencil in an old manual pencil sharpener and turning it, and you get a thin, narrow shaving strip of ivory. And no one had tried to do this before, and that's really what was original. Phidias developed a secret method for softening the ivory. Only a few ancient recipes survive. Professor Kenneth Lapatin is the first to rediscover them. 
Some seem to be a bit fantastic, like wrapping them in fish skin, uh, which I have never tried to do. Others say boil three days with mandrake root, which seemed a bit dangerous to try. Others said soak in oil, which did nothing for me. Uh, but one said soak in vinegar, which I did do, and, and that produced results. And what happens is that the ivory, which is tooth, it's largely calcium, has some of its chemical components leached out of it, and it becomes soft and flexible. And then you can mold it to shape and dry it out, and it will maintain that shape. And it was Phidias's genius that assembled these techniques from various different crafts to make this wonder of the world. Phidias and his assistants painstakingly followed this technique of shaping every detail. Every ivory section was made to fit exactly. The Zeus began as a wooden framework. To this, the molded ivory sections were fastened. The statue was built up, piece by piece, to a height of 45 feet. It took over seven years before Phidias was satisfied everything was perfect. The Zeus was then assembled inside the temple. It had a great reputation, but none of that really prepared you for that shock when you walked through the temple doors and saw the image. Unlike, I think, all of the other wonders, you couldn't see it from afar. You had to go and enter the temple, and then it hit you all at once. Oh, gee, that really is big. Wow. The writer Strabo, in the first century AD, was critical of its revolutionary composition. The sculptor may be criticized for not having appreciated the correct proportions. He has shown Zeus seated. So we have the impression that if Zeus moved to stand up, he would unroof the temple. The Zeus sits still. He's holding his emblems of power, the victory in his right hand, the scepter in his left. But he's not doing anything. The stilling of the god gives him greater power because there's the potential there for action. He's very aware. And it's that calmness uh, that becomes a hallmark of the classical style. Characteristics of Phidias' world wonder are echoed throughout Western art. From Byzantine images of Christ to 20th century statues of American presidents. In 1914, Daniel Chester French began work on the Lincoln Memorial statue. Using the same composition as the Zeus, Daniel French made the Lincoln statue out of 28 pieces of marble. Phidias had been meticulous in his study of light, but Daniel French discovered on a dull day his sculpture looked flat. He had to install an elaborate lighting setup. The scale of his sculpture was also criticized this time for being too small. Daniel French had to double its dimensions to satisfy his commissioners. Even then, the Lincoln statue was only half the height of Vaidius's Seuss. Over 450 years after Vaidius's world wonder was made, Roman soldiers and workmen arrived with special orders from the emperor Caligula. He had instructed them to bring the statue back to Rome so he could put his own head on it. Legend recalls the statue let out such a loud cackle of laughter. The scaffolding collapsed and the workmen fled. Luckily for them, the ruthless emperor was assassinated before they returned to Rome, empty-handed. By 391 AD, the Christian church banned the pagan cults and closed the temples. The Olympic Games ceased, and the great sanctuary of Olympia fell into disrepair. When the Seuss was 800 years old, it was brought up by Luasus, an imperial chamberlain from Constantinople, installed in his palace art collection there. Phidias's world wonder would not survive for long. The fire destroyed the palace and the collection, cremating the finest statue of all time. The influence of Greek art and architecture spread into Persia, an enemy of Greece. At the western tip of the Persian Empire lay the once great city of Halicarnassus. It is now the small resort of Bodrum, 
lying in present-day Turkey. At first, it appears an unlikely site for a world wonder. But in the fourth century BC, this was the capital of a powerful sea empire. Inland from the harbor lie the ruins of a tomb, the most extraordinary building ever constructed. It stood the height of a 14-story building, combined an assortment of styles and was covered with statues. It has left us the word mausoleum, used to describe monumental tombs ever since. Its style has been copied around the world, from the Freemasons Lodge in Washington, D.C., to the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne, Australia. The creation of this incredible structure was down to the vision of one of history's little-known yet extraordinary figures, King Morselus. A Persian governor, or satrap, he became king of this area, known as Caria. Morselus's unusual behavior included marrying one of his sisters, Artemisia. Erratic and headstrong, he founded a dynasty upon tyrannical control. Morselus married his elder sister, Artemisia, which is a very curious thing to do because um, brother-sister marriage does not seem to have uh, existed in the family uh, before his generation. From the day he became king in 377 BC, Morselus fiercely protected his kingdom. The ruins of the Mindus Gate are all that remain of his grand defensive walls, which stretched for seven miles around the city. He also built up a navy of a hundred ships. In the Persian tradition, he had a fortress palace, um, which is believed to have occupied the site currently where the castle is. Morselus is obviously a very powerful, dominant figure, successful politically and victorious in war. His forces stood poised to repel any Greek attack, yet Morselus openly welcomed Greek culture. Deluded by visions of his own grandeur, he planned the construction of a vast tomb. He chose a Greek architect to design it. His name was Pythias. He was unknown and unconventional. We don't know exactly where he came from, but he was very much a pioneering theoretical architect, probably the most important theoretical architect of the fourth century BC. He had very strong views on what was appropriate in architectural design and what was not. The Persians had a tradition of building tombs. Morselus followed the example of the Persian king Cyrus the Great, but Morselus's tomb would be far grander. Pythias designed for him an extraordinary building. It defied the conventional styles of the day. Apart from the Great Pyramid, it stood twice the height of any known building in the Western world, 14 stories high. The tomb would be unique. It would incorporate different styles from different countries. On the top, and never attempted before in architecture, a vast statue. Below, a stepped roof, inspired by the Egyptian pyramids. Beneath were Greek columns from temple architecture. Under these, giant statues resembling friezes, another architectural innovation. At the base was a tomb chamber. This alone used over 12,000 tons of stone. Morselus gave orders for his tomb to be built on top of an existing royal burial site. Because of the scale of the tomb, this choice of location presented problems. The mausoleum needed foundations dug to a depth of 20 feet. They soon flooded. Having drained them, Pythias increased stability by joining the masonry together. Iron clamps, or dovetails, were used to secure each block to the next, and dowels were fitted between the courses. To assemble the columns, a hole was cut in the base of each allowing iron connecting bars to join onto the next section. This technique is still used today. These blocks have been banded together so that they get strength from each other. The ancients also realized that for stone blocks to share the weight more effectively, particularly on a large structure, they needed to be clamped or dulled together. If there was a weakness in the foundation, for example, then the building could cope with it better. The mausoleum became a world wonder because of the statues adorning it, over twice life-size. 
These heroic figures stood high up on ledges and weighed many tons. By the time that the mausoleum is being built, great strides had been made in the development of cranes and siege engines. Massive timber constructions on wheels, capable of lifting dead weights to a height of 140 feet. We take it for granted that we can use machinery to help us on our construction sites. This beam weighs about one and a half tons. It was the invention of the crane by the ancients that enabled them, and now us, to lift heavy weights high onto a building quickly and with great precision. The heaviest statue sat on the very top of the mausoleum. It was an enormous sculpture of Morsalus and Artemisia in a chariot, pulled by four horses. This revolutionary idea of putting a statue on the top of a building has been copied since in triumphal arches and monuments. Morsalus never saw his completed tomb. He died in 352 BC. His body was interred within the mausoleum. But Artemisia, his sister and widow, would prove to be more formidable than Morsalus himself. After the death of Morsalus, Artemisia became queen. Her rise to power was unprecedented in the Western world. She continued to oversee the construction of the tomb. Throughout her short reign, she demonstrated her strength. Her bravery in war led the Persian king Xerxes to exclaim that his men had become women and his women men. There is a famous story that the Rhodians decided to attack Halicarnassus after the death of Morsalus when Artemisia was in control, thinking presumably they could easily overthrow a feeble woman. But she outwitted them and in fact captured them and then returned to Rhodes with the Halicarnassian fleet and captured Rhodes. Although she appeared to be invincible, her brother's death had weakened her spirit. Her decline was so tragic it was later romanticized by Renaissance artists. She seems to have been completely besotted with her elder brother to the extent that even after his death, she is supposed to have mixed some of the ashes of his remains with her wine and drunk it. Possibly this is one reason why she didn't outlive him by many years. Artemisia ruled for just two years before she died. She was interred alongside Morsalus, her brother and husband. They were carried away to the next world in their chariot. The mausoleum was finally finished after Artemisia's death. Her younger brother and sister also married before the dynasty died out. The mausoleum remained an object of admiration until the 15th century, when an earthquake destroyed much of it. The stone blocks were used for rebuilding the castle of St. John in the harbour. Most of the statues which had made the mausoleum a world wonder were thrown into lime kilns to make cement. One hundred miles up the Persian coast from Halicarnassus stood the largest marble temple ever constructed. It had been built at Ephesus, the wealthiest city in Asia Minor and the largest port on the Aegean. The temple, dedicated to the goddess Artemis, attracted pilgrims who flocked here to visit her cult shrine. Artemis was a mother goddess, her many breasts symbolizing the fertility of women. King Croesus, renowned for his wealth, financed the building of a temple to her in 550 BC. The architect chosen to build it was Chersiphron. Although he was highly trained in temple construction, this commission was on a scale never before attempted. One of the interesting things about temples such as the Temple at Ephesus are that they are among the earliest works of Greek architecture on any real scale. Persephone may well have visited the temples of Thebes in Egypt and been inspired by the forest of columns there. This temple of Artemis would be built entirely from marble and have 126 giant columns. Chersiphron's first challenge was to ensure a constant supply of enormous blocks of marble. The quarries were seven miles from the construction site and some marble blocks could weigh as much as 40 tons. 
engineer Scott Steedman has examined the difficulties of moving them. There's a lot of controversy about how the ancients moved heavy stones. We know that they dragged them, of course, but when you drag a stone, you have to overcome a huge amount of friction from the weight of the stone on its runners underneath. So if you want a system that doesn't involve dragging, then you may be able to rock them or even to roll them. This is a mock-up of a rocking device where the stone is strapped in between two large wooden rockers. This is a very efficient system of overcoming friction, and you can see just how easy it is to move even a heavy object. You could maneuver it, you could spin it, you could pull it up a ramp with considerably fewer men than if you were trying to drag it. Kessefron's methods of moving stone were highly advanced. He invented an ingenious roller pulled by oxen. The circular column elements were simply rolled along the ground within a frame pulled by oxen. But the rectangular elements were, of course, a rather more difficult proposition. And some of these were enormous. I mean, the largest of the architraves was nearly nine meters long, which is an enormous block of stone. And to move that, he encased the ends in timber work and turned them into wheels, and then simply attached draft animals to them and pulled them along. The temple measured a vast 180 by 360 feet, almost twice the size of the Parthenon. It was surrounded by a double row of columns, 60 feet high. One of the biggest problems was lifting up the giant lintels to the column tops. Stones like these weigh as much as five to 10 tons a piece. So how did the ancient Greeks lift such enormous weights to the top of a temple? We know that in ancient Egypt, they used a form of cantilever crane called a shadouf to lift water. And we know that the ancient Greeks used the same principle, but on a much larger scale, to lift weights at the dockside, cargo and even ships. So we can imagine that it's entirely possible that they used the same type of cantilever crane inside the temple, perhaps mounted on a mound of earth and stone, so that they could build up a platform halfway up the temple to give them the leverage they would need to reach right to the top. Unlike earlier civilizations, Gersefron's craftsmen had iron tools. This enabled the marble columns to be fluted and decorated, but it called for greater care in handling them. One of the great difficulties of manoeuvring these enormous blocks of stone is the precision that you need to get them finally into their exact place in the building. And you want techniques that can allow fine tuning and allow little shifts of position and so on. Kersifran had to ensure the 40 ton marble lintels were placed in exactly the right positions, or the whole temple could collapse like a house of cards. He contemplated suicide when faced with lowering the final section. A similar problem had once confronted the ancient Egyptians when lowering a 60-ton sarcophagus down a 30-meter shaft. Their solution was simple. They fill the shaft with sand, and they put the sarcophagus above the sand, and they cut a side shaft, and they take the sand from the south shaft, the sarcophagus will go down. Kersifron adapted this Egyptian technology to solve his problem. One of the techniques Kersifron used was to build a mound of sacks of sand, basically, and to put the architrave on that. And then by pulling away the sand at the base, the architrave is slipped slowly into position. And of course, this can be manipulated quite precisely and quite, quite carefully. The sand was let out of the bags, slowly lowering the stone into position. of Artemis took 50 years to build, and Kersifran didn't live to see its completion. His son followed him to finish the construction. The temple became a massive tourist attraction. Then, on the night of Alexander the Great's birth, tragedy struck. On the night of Alexander the Great's birth, Legend records that the goddess Artemis left the great temple to be with him. While she was away, a pyromaniac, wanting his name to be remembered forever, burned the temple to the ground. 
In the year 356 BC, there was what the sources describe as a madman, Herostratus, who was, it says, consumed with the desire for glory that his name should be remembered to the ends of time on the ends of the earth. And uh, he burnt the temple down. The temple had a wooden roof and staircase. Once a falling beam had toppled a column, collapse was inevitable. Although the pyromaniac's name was erased from all records for his appalling crime, the word Herostratum has remained to describe infamy. But the temple of Artemis had a second life. Within decades, it was rebuilt, becoming one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. During its reconstruction, Alexander the Great conquered every country around the eastern Mediterranean, bringing two ancient civilizations into the Greek Empire, Babylonia and Egypt. The capital of Egypt is Cairo, home to the oldest wonder of the world. The Great Pyramid still lies at the heart of Egyptian culture. On the edge of the city lies the Giza Plateau, the site of a vast pyramid complex. Pyramids are the tombs of the pharaohs. Pointing to the heavens, they ensured the pharaoh's safe journey into the next world. The pharaoh was buried deep inside in a hidden tomb chamber. In death, as in life, he was worshipped, feared and respected. Out of the 80 pyramids in ancient Egypt, the Great Pyramid is the largest. It was built in 2560 BC for the pharaoh Khufu. Like all pharaohs, Khufu was more than a king. The Egyptians believed he was the living image of a god come down to earth. The Great Pyramid is the largest stone structure in the world. It dwarfs all comparisons. Nearly as tall as the Washington Monument, five cathedrals can fit within it. Yet it was constructed without machinery or even iron tools. How were the ancient Egyptians able to build it? In the 5th century BC, the Greek historian Herodotus tried to find the answer. He gathered his information from the hearsay of local priests. The account he has left us is unreliable. The pharaoh Khufu compelled his subjects to labor as slaves for his own advantage. Some were forced to drag blocks of stone from the quarries in the Arabian hills to the Nile. The work went on in three monthly shifts, a hundred thousand men in a shift. The wickedness of Khufu is not something that you can regard, in Herodotus' telling at any rate, uh, as something which uh, is hard historical fact. It is anything but that. Herodotus' inaccuracies were exaggerated throughout the Christian era and later popularized by Hollywood. Producers, when they make this type of movies, they showed slavery building the pyramid. You know slavery can build a huge building, but it will never make anything genius. But if you do something with love and you believe that this is the tomb of the, of the king, who will be a god, you will do it. Guaranteeing the successful passage of the pharaoh into the next world was every Egyptian's duty. Peasantry was called up on national service to work on these things, because slaves, of course, were not, inv not involved. The Egyptians did not have, uh, in the Greek or Roman sense, a slave system at all. Although slavery didn't exist, workers were conscripted like an army. During the annual floods, farmers worked on the pyramids, which was preferable to going hungry. For all its faults, the Egyptian governmental system was one of the most successful that uh, human history has to show. It was a governmental system that lasted well in excess uh, of 3,000 years. And systems will only last uh, as long as there is a degree of acquiescence on the part of the subject peoples. The Great Pyramid was built with over two million stone blocks. Building the pyramid was the greatest feat in architecture. But did it really take 100,000 men to build it? The 
the Egyptians were practiced in pyramid building. Their production line ran highly efficiently. Instead of Herodotus's 100,000 slaves, only 20,000 laborers were used. In place of soldiers with whips, help was at hand to tend the sick and injured. The Egyptians put doctors, physicians on the site to save the workmen, because they found many workmen had a broken hands, and they put wood to support the broken hands. Others had broken legs. We found that all the tombs of men and women, the skeletons, had a stress on their back, because they were involved in moving heavy stuff, and they died during the construction of the pyramids. The Giza Plateau was chosen as the site because of the quantity and quality of the building stone. The men lived here in laborers' quarters, their heads shaven to deter lice. Working in gangs, they hauled the stone blocks from the nearby quarry on sledges. An illustration from the tomb of a nobleman shows this process on a grand scale. A colossus being dragged along. Sleepers or runners were often set into the ground to reduce friction but there were no rollers under the sledge. I know that Hollywood, the Technicolor industry, is very keen on rollers. Uh, you can get lots of uh, Israelites squashed under things like rollers, uh, and it makes for good copy. Uh, but there's no sign of any roller at all. And standing on the knee, there is somebody clapping his hands and saying, as the Egyptian text indicates, Jehuti Hoppe Meri Nesu, which is one Egyptian equivalent of what should we do with the drunken sailor. Uh, it, it ensures that everybody pulls at the right time. It gives a rhythm to, uh, to the whole operation. The lower part of the Great Pyramid used the largest blocks, weighing five tons or more. Although a stone block was fitted into place every two minutes, the Great Pyramid took 23 years to build. Provided the Egyptians had time, and provided they had their disciplined workforce, and these techniques, they could achieve what they needed to achieve. The ancient Egyptians set out the base like a compass. One side, aligned by the stars, runs north to south. With only geometry and rope to help them, it is baffling how they created a perfect square. Engineer Scott Steedman demonstrates one possible method for laying out a pyramid which may have been used by the Egyptians four and a half thousand years ago. One of the mysteries of the ancients is how they managed to survey structures as accurately as they did, as large as the pyramids in deserts just like this. There are a number of theories as to how they did it, but this is a simple way in which you can lay out a right angle. What we need is a little simple geometry and a piece of string. And what I want to do is to find the exact midpoint and mark it. And then we'll use that to lay out a right angle off our north-south line behind me. And here's the exact middle. I'm going to mark that with a green piece of twine because I need to find that. With the string, Scott forms a triangle. He loops the ends around two posts set upon the north-south line and pulls the middle of the string out to find the midpoint. Right, here's the green marker. Now, the trick about this is it doesn't matter how hard I pull because the tension is the same in both sides of the string. He marks the midway point with a post. He repeats this the other side, again marking the midway point with a post. By aligning these two points with a string, Scott has created a 90 degree angle. That's the original north-south line, and this is the new east-west line. The beauty of this system is that you wouldn't just do it once you would go on from where I stopped, right around the pyramid, and then you would go back the other way anti-clockwise, and then back again clockwise. Each time you'd close out the error just that little bit more until you got it to the precision that you wanted. The rough appearance of the Great Pyramid masks the precision of its construction. Its limestone casing was stripped away centuries ago to rebuild Cairo, but the pyramid remains the most accurately built stone structure on Earth. It covers 13 acres, the equivalent of nine football fields, yet each of its sides are accurate to within inches. In my opinion, pyramids built Egypt. Because building the pyramids made the Egyptians to think about art, architecture, uh, to think about astronomy, and this is why they became genius because they have to build the tomb of the king who would be a god. Dr. Hawass has discovered the remains of the surveyor's original workings. We found in our excavation holes about 40 centimeter in diameter, and no one understood the function of these holes. We found that these holes has to do 
was making the square base of the pyramid. After they finished the square base of the pyramid, they cut in the solid rock and they made the base of the pyramid around eight meters high, only from the rock of the plateau. The stones were dragged from the quarry to a short ramp and then hauled up onto the base. Dr. Howes has discovered remains of the ramp, which stretched a thousand feet from the quarry. The ramp, based on my discovery, is located to the southwest corner of the Great Pyramid. After the stones were hauled up onto the base, Dr. Howes believes they were then moved upwards using a girdle or spiral ramp. This wrapped around the outside of the pyramid and was made from mud and rubble. The spiral ramp grew higher as the pyramid was gradually built up. No one knows with certainty the exact ramp design. Other archaeologists believe the ramp was a straight one. I prefer the long straight ramp option, partly because a ramp circling the pyramid would have been inherently unstable for the heavy loads to be dragged up it. And it's also difficult to understand how you could drag these heavy blocks round the corners on such a ramp. But a straight ramp to the top would have ended up being a mile long stretching far beyond the quarry. To retain a manageable gradient, its length and height would have needed continual adjustment. On the other hand, the spiral ramps have cornering problems. As the Great Pyramid grew higher, the stones became smaller. Rollers running under the stones may have been used here for maneuvering. The builders used only the simplest techniques. The Egyptians used stone tools and copper tools. Copper very frequently mixed with arsenic, which of course hardens up the, the copper, but uh, iron was certainly not used. In fact, the Egyptians were very late into the Iron Age. Without any sophisticated tools, the stones were fitted with watertight precision to a height of 480 feet. Until little more than 150 years ago, the Great Pyramid remained the tallest structure on Earth. When built to the top, it resembled a series of steps. It was then ready to be cased in top-quality limestone. Uh, and then, of course, you start smoothing it off from the top down. So you do the top bit, uh, then you take uh, the girdle ramp down, then the next bit, and so on, until the whole thing is done. After 23 years, Khufu's tomb, the largest pyramid ever built, was complete. Pyramids are the most enduring ancient structures on Earth, and the Great Pyramid is the only ancient wonder of the world standing today. It has been imitated many times. Its stable form inspired one of today's most famous architects, I. M. Pei. He designed the pyramid at the Louvre in Paris out of glass. Pyramid is built of stone, it's solid, it's for the dead, and I hope the glass pyramid is transparent, it's for the living. But one thing I learned uh, to respect the Egyptians is the, is the proportion of that pyramid, of the Giza pyramid. It's, it's the only one that we came to that satisfies from both directions, whether you look at it head on or look at it at 45 degrees. It's neither too flat nor too peaky. So uh, I think that that, I think, proved the point that, to myself anyway, that the Egyptians were right 4,000 years ago. Khufu's pyramid was so admired that his son and grandson followed him, building their tombs alongside his on the Giza Plateau. But the Great Pyramid has remained the father of all ancient structures. The people came for the first time, they looked at it, said, God, how it was built, who built it? The Arabs, when they came in the 9th century AD, they said that man fears time, and time fears pyramids. It's true, the pyramids are immortal. It will live because of the way that the pyramid was constructed. The techniques used to build the Great Pyramid would pave the way for the other six world wonders to follow.
The Great Pyramid, the foundation for the other world wonders, was built in 2650 BC. It would take another 2,000 years before the next wonder of the ancient world was created in the most spectacular city on Earth, Babylon. The city was surrounded by inhospitable terrain for hundreds of miles. Merchants journeyed across the wilderness from every corner of the ancient world to trade their goods in the wealthy city. But of all the sites in Babylon, one impressed the parched travelers more than any other, the Hanging Gardens. I'm most intrigued by the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. I wish it was still there. Of all the seven wonders, that is the one that I wish had not been destroyed. It's so unusual, it excites one's imagination. Fragments of the ancient city survive, but the Hanging Gardens have been lost forever. Some scholars doubt whether they could have existed here. How was it possible to have built terraced gardens in an area without building stone. Babylon is built on a huge, great, flat alluvial plain, and, and there's no stone nearby, so they have to use mud. And they would dig the mud from the riverbank, creating a sort of moat around the city, and then the mud would be formed into bricks. And then as it bakes in the sun, that you would end up with really quite a sturdy product. You can't just take the bare mud and pack it into a brick. So he's processing the mud by stamping it and adding water to it, to give it just the right consistency, so that when it is slopped into the mould, he has a brick which you can recognisably see as a brick and not just a heap of mud. Mud, when it's baked and compacted, is a very strong and capable building material. And there are many examples in ancient history of, of walls that are built to really quite a significant height using baked earth and mud. Sometimes that needs to be reinforced, perhaps with straw or reeds, which would be laid flat and then more earth compacted on top. But as long as you created a big, wide, massive wall, essentially, it would be a very strong and capable material. Babylon was situated on the Euphrates in present-day Iraq. In the 6th century BC, King Nebuchadnezzar rebuilt it. The walls were so splendid that the Greek poet Antipater had included them as one of the Seven Wonders. Herodotus was also impressed by them. They formed a square. Along the top were walkways, wide enough for two chariots to pass. There were a hundred bronze gates in the circuit of the walls. It was some 56 miles around the whole city. Behind the Ishtar Gateway, inside the city walls, the streets were laid out on a grid plan. Babylon was the most splendid city in the world. A blend of sophistication and order. King Nebuchadnezzar ruled Babylonia from his palace. He married Princess Amatus from the land of Medea. Marriage symbolized a prosperous union between their countries. Babylonia now looked forward to a period of peace and plenty. Above the palace, Nebuchadnezzar built the grandest celebration of this new era, the Hanging Gardens. They were a spectacular surprise for his queen. The earliest account of them comes from Barossus, a priest writing 200 years after they were built. And within this palace, Nebuchadnezzar erected the so-called Hanging Garden, because his wife, having been brought up in the country of Medea, had a passion for mountain surroundings. The gardens are often controlled by the, the monarch of a particular culture. That monarch is showing that he or she can control the landscape and can make it flower in a way that uh, God cannot in the landscape around them. Controlling water, of course, is controlling life in a very desert landscape or in an arid landscape is a great feat. In the Middle East, gardening was a respected profession. Plants were grown for medicine and also for the perfume industry. The importance of fragrance may explain why accounts record that some gardeners were blind and some female.
Records show that Nebuchadnezzar's gardener was given special rations from the palace. He is believed to have been an expert from Judea, a country with a similarly arid climate. The Babylonians had a great knowledge of plants. The gardeners in Babylon would have selected the best plants to thrive in the hot, arid climate. The Middle East is not all a desert, but it's generally arid, and it was felt important to bring uh, exotic types of plants, different types of plants, and a richness of vegetation in a controlled situation so people could enjoy it, particularly the king. There are a number of ways plants have adapted to survive in harsh environments like the Middle East. One way is to have thin, needle-like leaves. Grasses and conifers are good examples of this. Their very small surface area ensures little water loss. Others have leathery or waxy leaves to prevent water loss. Often they are grey in colour which reflects the glare of the sun. Some plants have leaves covered in fine hairs. These reduce the drying effect of the wind and also trap the cold night air to keep the plant cool during the day. Oak, willow and cedar, ilex, plain and palm. The lists of the trees and the plants in the hanging gardens are endless. They were compiled by historians centuries later and are often inaccurate. It is believed the gardens contained many plants and trees from the land of Medea, the homeland of Nebuchadnezzar's queen. As well as adding color, the flowers of orange and lemon trees would have produced a fragrant scent. However the gardens were planted out, they needed water. Ancient writers recorded that there were hidden machines used for irrigation. Scholars have investigated buckets on ropes, water wheels, and even the Archimedes water screw. This device is attributed to the great Greek mathematician and inventor. It is believed Archimedes created it while in Egypt, having watched villagers pump water from the Nile. But the hanging gardens were built two centuries before him. The only device we have evidence for at that period is in fact the Shadoof, a very simple tip beam device that's known as early as the third millennium BC. You have a counterweight at one end and a basket on the end of a rope or a pole at the other that lifts the water up. We have illustrations of it from uh, the second millennium BC onward. We have illustrations of it in Assyrian art from the time the hanging gardens supposedly were functioning. And there are no illustrations of other devices that would have been suitable. So it seems to me that this is the only solution. Today we overcome our engineering problems with machinery. The ancients often looked no further than human labor. And in Babylon, there was an endless supply. The Western perception of the hanging gardens has been highly idealized. Terraced gardens with abundant water, even waterfalls. When I was a child, the image uh, conjured up by the hanging gardens was that of gardens that somehow hung downwards. But in fact, if you look at gardens that are carefully maintained in the Middle East on terraces, generally you have plants that rise upward from the terraces. In arid regions, in the desert, water is so precious, it's like gold. They have to control how they use it very, very carefully. They let the water come in down channels, and then they release the water so that it just rushes out, just for perhaps 10 minutes a day, and then they'll shut it off again and conserve it for the next time, next day. Just a tiny amount of water has created an intensity of color and green trees, which is just totally unexpected. Water could have been taken from the Euphrates, carried or lifted up to a cistern on the top terrace. From there, it would have trickled down through the different levels of the garden. The irrigation of the hanging gardens is only part of the riddle, taunting archeologists. The more baffling puzzle has been to find their exact location. The city of Babylon was known across the ancient world, but accounts of the hanging gardens were hard to find, even at the time of their construction. Well, the hanging gardens are a kind of historical mirage. We have sources from the first century AD that say there was hanging gardens in Babylon. But Herodotus, who's writing very close to the time the gardens supposedly were built, doesn't mention the gardens at all. If they were so spectacular, you'd expect him to say something. It is likely they were destroyed within a century of their construction. After Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon became a pawn in the struggle between the Persians and the Macedonians, and was severely damaged. We know that Babylon was very badly destroyed by the Persian king Xerxes in the 480s BC, 
and the fragile mechanisms and the fragility indeed of the plants themselves, one can't imagine that they survived that kind of ordeal. Some archaeologists have looked elsewhere to find another location for them. The most convincing explanation which says that there is a confusion in the beginnings of this legend and that really what the hanging gardens refer to are the palace gardens built by an Assyrian king in Nineveh, which was the great capital of the Assyrian kingdom, something like 100, 100 or 150 years before Nebuchadnezzar. Despite their short lifespan, the gardens have gained legendary status. They remain unique among the seven wonders as the only one displaying nature's beauty, and they live on as the most famous gardens ever. The balance of power in the Middle East would change, and with it, the fortunes of Babylon. Persian armies under Cyrus the Great overran the Babylonian Empire. Just 200 years later, an awesome army recruited amongst the valleys and mountains of the Greek mainland would conquer Babylon once again. Under Alexander the Great, they stormed across the plains, east as far as the Indus and south as far as Egypt. Greek artists, sculptors and masons followed in the wake of Alexander's armies. They spread the influence of Greek architecture and culture to new lands, as well as harnessing local techniques for use back in Greece. Under Alexander, for the first time, all the wonders of the ancient world were brought within the same empire. The idea of seven wonders is in many ways inconceivable without Alexander the Great. His conquests in Babylonia and Egypt brought the Hanging Gardens and the pyramids to greater Greek prominence. Babylon in particular caught Alexander's imagination. Alexander was interested in Babylon as the centre of, of learning, the centre of power, the traditional centre for Mesopotamia. And indeed, uh, he died in Babylon um, and was planning his last campaigns there um, and was, I think, planning to make Babylon the capital of his syncretistic empire. So he certainly saw Babylon as a key place in the geography of the world. After his death in 323 BC, the empire was divided up amongst his generals. Ptolemy took Egypt, Antigonus seized Asia Minor. In between these two powerful territories lay the small island of Rhodes. By trading equally with both Egypt and Asia Minor, the islanders had benefited much from their neutrality. Forced to choose sides, the people of Rhodes took up arms on behalf of Ptolemy of Egypt. Outraged, Antigonese from Asia Minor attacked Rhodes with a huge fleet. Against all odds, the Rhodians defeated them and celebrated their victory by building a giant bronze colossus to their savior, the sun god Helios. Helios was closely related to Apollo, the god of light, of truth, of vision. He is the god of the sun, uh, who was especially worshipped on Rhodes. There were many bronze statues on the island, but the Colossus was easily the largest. To build, it cost 300 talents, equal to 300 warships. The Colossus was a memorial to themselves, to their victory, to their freedom, their continuing freedom. And as such, it was certainly worth putting a lot of money into. 300 talents, they had won it from the enemy, why not? Bronze casting was a major business on the island. Statues were mass-produced and exported to Greece and Italy. The sculptor chosen to create the Colossus was Harris of Lindos. One story recalls his initial design as being 60 feet tall, but the islanders insisted on a statue that was twice that size, 120 feet. Harris doubled his dimensions and set to work. Harries was especially well qualified for this job because he'd studied with one of the greatest bronze artists of the fourth century BC, Lysippus. 
Lysippus was known for producing many, many statues, 1,500 in his lifetime. And so in the workshop of Lysippus, one can imagine hanging on the wall a whole row of arms, a row of legs, body parts which were more or less interchangeable. Unfortunately, none of these mass production techniques could be used for the Colossus. No bronze statue had ever approached 120 feet in height. Harris had to manufacture everything on site. The casting would have been directly next to where the statue was to be put up. Probably a whole series of pits in which the pieces were cast. Those pieces would have been riveted together and the statue would have been set up on the spot. The basic techniques of bronze casting have changed little over the centuries. From a scale model, the first process is to make a copy. Today, a latex mold is filled with liquid wax. Harris may have used clay or terracotta molds. When the mold is pulled apart, the wax replica remains. Replicas are then covered in a heat-resistant coating and fired inside a kiln. The wax inside melts and is released through pipes and channels. The hollow replica can now be filled with molten bronze. When it cools and the casing removed, the finished bronze remains. The Colossus gradually took shape. Piece by piece, each bronze section was attached to a framework of wood and iron. Iron had been in use for weapons, for tools. Iron was used also in classical times for the bronze casting industry. Iron pins were used to support a project during casting. Keeping the statue stable was a problem. Stones were dropped down the ankles into the feet to add weight to the base. As the colossal sun god grew taller, the workmen needed access all around the statue. Harris's solution was to bank up earth around the colossus with a spiral pathway, rather like a girdle ramp used in building the Great Pyramid. There was one drawback to this. When Carries designed the statue, he would never have a chance to see what the finished work would look like until the work was finished, which is certainly a deterrent in producing a colossus. You can't look at it at various stages of the process, put it all together, take it apart again. You have to wait till the whole thing is finished before you get your first view of what it's really going to look like. By the time Jerez reached the head of the Colossus, the mountain of Earth was 100 feet high. Altogether, 225 tons of bronze was riveted into place. Gold rays were fitted to his crown, which pointed to the sun. After 12 years exhausting work, the mountain of Earth was removed. Harais, magnificent colossus of the sun god Helios, 120 feet high, was left to stand guard at the harbor side. Carries certainly must have found out how to cast a big statue like that in many pieces. What he overlooked, apparently, was finding out from somebody how to make it stand up. Obviously, nobody had been making colossi, and so nobody thought carefully enough about how to keep this statue standing. When you scale up a structure, you have to think very carefully about how it's going to support itself. What works well when it's small may not work at all when it's large. If you scale up a hollow sculpture, for example, then the weight of the shell itself may overload it. And any tall, thin structure or sculpture will be much more vulnerable to wind and earthquake. The Colossus stood for just 56 years. In 226 BC, an earthquake brought it crashing to the ground burying several houses beneath it. With time, people forgot how it had once stood. During the Renaissance, Martin van Heemskerk, the first artist to draw the seven ancient wonders, depicted it astride the harbor. Impossible, but as people tell the story over and over again, the statue gets bigger and bigger until a ship can sail beneath it. When a statue is standing on two legs, and it's a naked statue, as this would have been in the uh, tradition of producing statues of gods and of heroes, 
It's the, the legs have to be close together to give it the support that it needs. But the idea of the Colossus straddling the harbor still remains popular. Engineer Gavin Davis assesses the likelihood of this. If the legs were together on the sculpture, it would be a lot more stable because the weight of the, of the upper half of the body is carried vertically down through the, through the legs. And then provided the foundations are strong enough, then you should have a relatively stable structure. If the Colossus had stood with the legs apart, it would have been considerably weakened. The key here is concerning the Colossus is how the, the, the weight load is carried down the two legs when they're quite wide apart. Once you do start getting any wind loading on this kind of structure, then there are obviously weak areas around the two ankles, for example, would be an obvious area of concern. Over 2,000 years after the Colossus, Auguste Bartholdi designed the Statue of Liberty. He employed the greatest engineer of the day, the Frenchman, Alexandre Eiffel. Avoiding the mistakes of the Colossus, Eiffel introduced revolutionary technology to ensure the Liberty would stand forever. The Statue of Liberty was an engineering innovation. Eiffel designed an iron framework to form a backbone. The statue, a hollow shell made from copper, was then hung over the frame. In 1986, after standing for a hundred years, it was overhauled. Architect Blaine Cliver was a part of the restoration team. The statue itself is 153 feet tall. That's all the way up to the top of the torch. Eiffel's design was light. It is a skeletal frame and is anchored to the pylons which are into the base, the stone base, upon which the statue stands. Unlike the Colossus of Rhodes, the outer casing carries no weight at all. Consisting of 300 copper plates weighing 80 tons, its weight is transferred by ribs and armature bars to Eiffel's central skeleton. Larry Belente was the consulting engineer during the restoration work. It does have the, the modern concept of if it's too stiff, it will break, and if it has flexibility, it will give with the wind, give with the temperature changes, and therefore be able to, uh, like an airplane wing, go up and down and not, not break and, uh, and come to pieces. So this was revolutionary at the time, and it absolutely is the only way you could have done this and had it survive as long as it has. There are plans to use this technology to rebuild the Colossus of the Island of Rhodes. Nicolas Katsianinis, one of the leading bronze sculptors in the world today, dreams of recreating the Colossus. He has already made some enormous bronzes. He now plans to build the Colossus to stand the height of a 15-story building. I'm proposing two different designs. The first one is going to look as the old Colossus by putting this arm like that, okay? Of course, now, with the new technology, we do something different. And now I'm proposing the second proposition is to stretch the arm, giving the light to the world. Okay, now we've got the technology to do that. Along with the Liberty, it's going to be the largest. But it's going to have one advantage over Liberty, simply because it's connected with this sort of thrill. One of the wonders of the world is going to be recreated. And that's the main thing. That's the beauty of it. The fallen colossus remained a wonder of the world. Tourists flocked from all over the Mediterranean to marvel at its giant remains. The thumb was bigger than most statues. And this is what really captivated visitors who would make almost a pilgrimage to the statue to uh, see that giant thumb. An oracle predicted that Rhodes would suffer great misfortune if the statue were rebuilt. So it was left lying where it had fallen for 900 years. In the 7th century AD, the statue was carted off as scrap metal. Obviously, its tourist value by then was much reduced, and uh, yet its monetary value was still high. Usually when uh, bronze statues were melted down, the metal was reused for weapons, tools, mostly ammunition. It took 980 camels to carry off the surviving metal from this statue. Charis, like the Colossus he created, became a broken man. One story recalls how he miscalculated the cost of doubling the statue's size, leaving him bankrupt. Destroyed by debt, he committed suicide. 
last of the seven ancient wonders, was built in the city that had given birth to the Moor, Alexandria. Founded by Alexander the Great in 332 BC, it was the world's first metropolis. Standing at the head of the Nile, it rivaled ancient Rome in size and power. From its earliest days, the city has been a melting pot of civilizations. You could find any product from India, from Italy, from Greece, from uh, Africa. Most of the goods for Alexandria's markets were brought by sea. As traders approached the Egyptian coast, they kept a lookout for the familiar sight of Alexandria's wonder, beckoning them to safe harbour. Known as the Pharos, it was a lighthouse. Standing over 400 feet high, it was the world's first skyscraper. Lighthouses had been built around the Mediterranean from as early as the 7th century BC. The waters off Egypt were particularly treacherous, hiding submerged rocks that had brought many ships to grief. It could be argued that the Pharos is perhaps the most utilitarian of all the Seven Wonders. It actually has ostensibly this practical function of guiding ships into the harbour of Alexandria. But the Pharos was more than a beacon. It had another function. Here we have a tower which expresses the, the power and control and prestige of the Ptolemaic dynasty, the kings of Egypt of the time. Alexandria was the first megacity. Palaces were stacked upon palaces, yet the Pharos exceeded everything else. It is yet another way in which Alexandria can be put at least one notch, and preferably several notches, uh, above every other city in the world. Built during the reign of Ptolemy II, the Pharos announced to the world the grandeur of Alexandria. Designed by the architect Sostratus of Nidus, it took 12 years to construct. At the top, a vast furnace was kept raging. It blasted its golden light 50 miles out to sea. Some reports mention extraordinary solar mirrors used to laser enemy ships at sea. The Pharos was built in three sections. On the base sat a square tower, 233 feet tall. The second section was octagonal, and above it was the lighting apparatus. It's believed a spiral rampway inside allowed donkeys to take up the loads of fuel. We know that it did have ramps inside it, and that donkeys, for instance, could perhaps have gone up to the top of it on these ramps carrying loads. But it's a bit of an open question as to exactly how it worked, I think. The light at the top was created by a furnace. It was directed out to sea via large bronze reflectors. One of the problems, of course, of a lighthouse, particularly in a location such as Egypt, which is relatively poor in trees and wood, would be what do you actually use to feed the flames? Alexandria was the largest port in the Greek world, and it is likely that the city had access to many raw materials. Various fuels have been suggested, ranging from wood and oil to fats and tree resins. The Pharos was built from solid blocks of granite and limestone. Unlike tall buildings of today, its walls had to bear all the weight of the masonry above. Modern buildings have very thin outer skins, sometimes entirely glass, and the walls themselves carry no weight at all. This is achieved by using a frame. I'm holding on to one of the steel stanchions here, so the ground floor and the interior can be entirely open. Frame technology was only invented relatively recently with the advent of modern materials like steel and concrete. Because the ancients were limited to stone, they had to build enormously thick and heavy walls to reach the heights that they wanted. In the 19th century, Jules Baudet, a forerunner of Eiffel, made the most ambitious copy of the Pharos. Although never built, 
he incorporated a metal frame into his design for a tower to light up Paris. Built entirely from stone, it is unclear how the pharos could stand so tall. Yet there are many ancient accounts of it. The pharos of Alexandria is actually one of the better documented of the Seven Wonders. It ceased to be a lighthouse at the end of the classical period, but it went on to be used as a mosque. In fact, what they did was on the top where the lantern had been, they built a mosque. There are Arab historians who had climbed it and, and give very good detailed descriptions with dimensions. So we can be fairly sure that it really was as it's described. Today, a medieval castle stands on the site of the Pharos, which stood until 1303. Named after the small island on which it was built, Pharos has become a generic word for all lighthouses. Like the Mausoleum and Colossus, the Pharos was destroyed by an earthquake. For 700 years, its remains lay on the seabed. But recently, a marine archaeologist has begun bringing to the surface the world wonder that has remained hidden for centuries. When the pharos was toppled into the sea, its massive building stones were scattered across the harbor. Marine archaeologist Jean-Yves Empereur has been excavating the underwater site. He still can't comprehend the scale of his discovery. When, for the first time, we dived, we couldn't imagine such chaotic and huge underwater collection of such thousands and thousands of columns, of bases of columns, of capitals, of sphinxes, of obelisks and so on. It was incredible. And every time we dive, even now, after thousands of diving here, we go back to the surface with a strange feeling. It's a fantastic sight. You cannot imagine, you can describe it. You have to dive to, to have this so strange feeling. Among his discoveries was a vast granite lintel weighing 75 tons, which he believes to be a supporting beam from the ferrous. You can see even in this castle, uh, they used uh, uh, <coughs> some uh, very strong stones like the red granite from Aswan. You see uh, at the base of the windows or the frame of the doors, they used ancient pieces of granite or clumps even in the masonry, exactly like the, the pieces we are in the underwater site, to reinforce uh, the building itself. So we are on the place here, on the underwater site. This is a slip from where we, we jump into the water. Jean-Yves has been diving here since 1991. The vast underwater site covers five acres. His team continues to log the size and weight of every block. Deciphering the thousands of artifacts is a monumental task. The Pharos fell amongst palaces and the other treasures of the once great city. So Jean-Yves and his team have a painstaking task of deduction. Using inflatable parachutes, they lift the huge obelisks and statues weighing many tons. One day they hope to establish once and for all how the Pharos was constructed. The world's tallest lighthouse was brought down by an earthquake. Nowadays, tall buildings are thoroughly tested. Gavin Davis examines the stability of the Ferris. There's no doubt this would have been a very challenging structure to build, but to build something that's supposedly 400 feet tall or more um, would have been very difficult at that time. When comparing the Pharos with one of the Great Pyramids, for example, you can see that there's a great difference because the pyramids are inherently more, more stable than the structure. Comparing it to something like a pyramid, which would be have a much, much wider base, then it really is still a very tall and thin building. Whereas the ancients were building into the unknown, today's architects are required to check every uncertainty. This building's the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, and a significant amount of testing was carried out to look at how it might behave in the wind. The computer these days allows us to eliminate even the most unlikely problem areas from buildings, which means that we can design closer to the edge and design buildings that perform better. Today's architectural wonders stand within the safeguards of science and technology. The seven wonders have become icons of the ancient world. They stood not solely by the laws of science, but by the will of an age determined to build the impossible. The seven ancient wonders were part of an age of optimism, an attempt to use technology to the limit, to go further than people had ever gone before in creating these massive monumental structures. 
Architecture and sculpture continue to pay a debt to the excellence of their construction. Still, there is this notion that in antiquity, uh, there were seven structures that were the epitome of magnificence and achievement. The seven ancient wonders challenged the finest minds. Even now, we still wonder how to match them. If we tried to make a list of today's wonders, could we find seven? Or, or would we find 200? Their high ideals have stood the test of time. They remain the cornerstones of our finest constructions. Architecture has to serve a purpose. And uh, I think the symbolism of the pyramid uh, is as valid, in my opinion, today as it was then. The seven wonders of the ancient world set the supreme standard and keep alive the dreams of the ancients.